We'll be in the book of Nehemiah mostly today. Nehemiah. Nehemiah. Nehemiah, as you know, is a cupbearer for the king, which means that he always drank before the king, and the king's name was Artaxerxes. Nehemiah was probably a, uh, he's uh, been kidnapped. Perhaps he was a eunuch. Uh, he was brought into the king's service. So we've talked about him before a few weeks ago. You know, I, I talked about toxic people, and I dealt with uh, Judas and his toxicity around Jesus and how Jesus handled him and what he did. Today, I want to take it another step forward, if you would. I, I've entitled this message, Discernment for Dummies. How you know there's a lot of dummy books out there? And it's not a put-down to call us dumb. It just means we ain't learned yet. Amen. We, we're learning. There's a difference in ignorant and unlearned. Unlearned means you don't know. Ignorant means you don't know that you don't know. Amen. There's a lot of ignorant people out there. They don't know they don't know. But uh, to not know something and to learn is a very important thing. Discernment's a powerful thing. For those watching online, this is this one of the messages that literally needs to um, go to many, many homes in the world today. You know, so a few weeks ago, it seemed like everybody I talked to was dealing with toxic people, and they would talk to me about people that were toxic in their lives. And weeks like that are like discernment for dummies for me. I, I figure if I keep coming across the same issue again and again, it might be something that I ought to teach about and talk about to help you out. And our prayer this morning is that Christ would be magnified. And I feel that just happened. I, I sense his presence in this house. So as we turn into Nehemiah, amen, we're going to talk about uh, chapter 2, verse 1. Are you comfortable? You may not be throughout this message. Preaching is not a spectator sport to me. Amen. Many times we go and you know, and I, I observe you. I don't know if you realize this, but I, I've gone to football games and basketball. I've been to rodeo with me. I've seen you get up and shout. I've seen you throw your hands up in the air. I've seen you get a little bit crazy. Some of you, I've never been with you on a Saturday night, but I'm, I understand some of you do get a little beside yourself. And then you come to church and you become spectators. You just kind of sit and observe. That's why I love worship. I love to enter in. And when I, when I hear a song say dance, I'm going to, I may not dance well, but I can move a little. Can I get an amen? Uh, so I'm going to move just a little bit. And when I'm here and I'm, I'm talking with you, amen, it's important for you to get feedback from you. That comes with an amen or a come on or an oh me. Uh, it gave, gave, take, watching you take notes is important. Amen, this, because you're not going to remember this. Even I take notes when I, I hear preachers preaching or, or if I hear something even on the radio or something. I'm going to take a note. I'm going to write some things down because it's important for me to keep hold of this and to grasp these truths that we're going to be sharing with you. Amen. So I, I, don't, I want you to come in here, but I want you to leave better. I always want you to leave better than you came in. Amen. And I feel that happens a lot here. So this cupbearer, listen, for a cupbearer to go before a king sad, it's almost like a death sentence. As a matter of fact, his countenance had to be up. He had to be almost a jovial one. No matter how he felt, he had to come in before the king smiling. Everything's good. When he drank before the king and had to drink the wine of the king, he had to keep that smile on his face. He couldn't be sad. But at this time, Nehemiah comes in because he has a hometown known as Jerusalem. There in Jerusalem, the walls have fallen down. And as you already know, when walls come down, the enemy can come in. We're seeing that today and watching and observing what's going on in Ukraine. Amen. The wall's coming down. The enemy's coming in. What do you do? So here's this man with a heart for his hometown. He wants to go back. Chapter 2, verse 1 says, In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was brought for him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. I had not been sad in his presence before. So the king asked me, why does your face look so sad when you are not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. So the king discerned immediately that this man was in trouble, that he was struggling with some things. So he begins to share with him that there were things going on in Jerusalem, and Artaxerxes literally gave him a green light to go there and start rebuilding. Now, I'm, we've gone through this before, but I'm going to walk you through it again. So he goes and he begins to rebuild, and he, he gets people to go with him. In uh, chapter 17 of verse 2, he says, Then I said to them, You see the trouble we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins, and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem, and we will no longer be in disgrace. So after Nehemiah saw the ruins, he had a choice. He could do nothing. 
or he could believe for provision and cooperation. He got provision from the king. He got cooperation from the people. Now skip down into chapter 6. Amen. Because I'm going to leave you up until I get through the text here, if you would. And as they begin to build, and as they brought the walls up so far, and if you know the story, some of the men had a weapon in one hand and a trial in the other. They began to pay attention as they built, and they brought the walls up. The enemies kept messing with them. The enemies were led by two men, Sanballat and a guy named Tobiah. Amen. These were guys what I will call toxic. Everybody say toxic. Amen. These guys are dangerous. These guys are allergic to love. I'll repeat myself several times in this message for you to catch that. Nehemiah 6, 1 says, when word came to Sanballat and Tobiah, Geshem the Arab and the rest of our enemies that I had rebuilt the wall and not a gap was left in it, though up to that time I had not set the doors and the gates. Sanballat and Geshem sent me this message, come let us meet together in one of the villages on the plain of Ono. But they were scheming to harm me. In other words, they wanted to assassinate me. They wanted to take the leader out. We're seeing this again today as we've been watching the last couple of weeks with the leader of Ukraine, trying to take the leader out. So I sent messengers to them with this reply. I'm carrying on a great project, and I cannot go down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and go down to you? Four times they sent me the same message, and each time I gave them the same answer. We'll get back to this text in a minute. Lord, I pray, Lord, as our enemy is on the prowl, he's seeking to devour. His attack is subtle and lethal. He's wearing us down with things like COVID and elections and constant turmoil. He's seeking to monopolize these. Even the way we respond differently to the pressures to divide and conquer, we see that. We're tired, God, and we need to hear from you this morning. Speak to us. Your servants are listening. We need to see you high and lifted up, magnified in this place. And as we prayed, because when you are magnified, our hearts are filled with joy. It puts things back in their proper perspective. When our hearts find their true cry, in other words, we're crying that we were originally designed to cry out before sin twisted our cry in on itself. We won't bow down to idols. We'll stand strong. Even during this tumultuous time, God, we're going to worship you. We won't be formed by our feelings. We will not allow politics to ruin us. We will stand. We'll hold fast to what is true. Jesus, we lift you up. We sit under your word this morning. Speak to us now in Jesus' name name. And everyone said, amen. God bless you. you. may be seated. Oh, to get used to wearing glasses. Oh, God, I have stumbled. I have fallen. I've talked with my pastor this morning. He wears readers like I've done forever. And you know, when you're wearing readers, you get done reading whatever you're reading. You lift them up on top of your head. And he told me that this morning, he said, I did that so much, but I realized that online, I look bad when I'm lifting my glasses all the time. He said, so I've learned just to keep them down, and it keeps everybody fuzzy. And he said, the fuzzier they are, the better I preach, because I can't pay any attention to their facial expressions. But when I'm wearing this, I can see you in the back, Cuba. Amen. I, for, for months, I couldn't even tell what time it was. That's why I went long. Now I can see, and I have no excuse. Amen. In my view, one of the most mysterious aspects about Jesus was his tendency to leave people out or to let people go. Let them keep on walking. Let me give you kind of a mundane example of that. Mark chapter 5, you heard me preach a lot about the woman with the issue of blood. She came and touched the hem of his garment. That happened when Jairus, the leader of the synagogue, was taking Jesus, amen, to go to his 12-year-old daughter who was dying. When he got there, the Bible says, as the woman was healed, walked away, Jesus gets there. He brought with him three disciples, not all 12. He brought three. Matt, uh, who were they, Matthew, Mark, and Luke? No, it was Peter, James, and John. Again, learning to pour your life. When you deal around toxic people, he didn't pour his life all the way into Judas. He went for people who were teachable. That would have been Matt. Uh, I want to say Matthew again. And that would be Peter, James, and John. He poured his lives into these men, and these men turned the world upside down. So he brings them with him. When he gets there, Mark chapter 5, verse 40 says, when he got there, there were people, they laughed at him. I call it toxic laughter. They laughed at him, but he put them all outside. He put them outside the building and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in there where the child was. Imagine that if you would. You'd think to yourself, I have the power of God inside of me to raise 
raise this child. Maybe I want these people to be around me, but not Jesus. He pushed them outside. They're toxic and they're laughing. They, they laughed as if uh, they were unbelieving. They didn't believe that he could do this and he could raise. Matter of fact, Jesus said the little girl's not dead. She's only sleeping. That's when they laughed because they said she was dead. And they were there to make money off of her as far as their laughter goes. They got paid for that. But it's toxic. The word toxic is dangerous. It's something you want to stay away from. Amen. It's like that mold that hit a couple of years ago. Amen. It's not something you want to be breathing. So he put them out. Now, I'm thinking to myself, if I had the power to raise her up, I'm going to make sure you're watching me do it. But Jesus didn't do that. He pushed them away. Amen. And, I, I, you know, I would have maybe wanted him to see this happen, this miracle. But it's not like Jesus. It's not like he was such a private person who doesn't care about the struggling. Well, that's what he did. He moved toward the ones everybody else neglected. In one passage, we read where he left the 99, and he went for the one. He saw one that was teachable, one that he could reach, one that he could help. Amen. He went out of his way for the struggler, the person who felt like no one else saw them, the confused, the sinful, the dirty, the prostitute, the tax collector. He moved toward them, but he also put some out. When do you walk away? I have found there are 41 examples in the Gospels where Jesus walked away or let people walk away. 41 times Jesus let people walk away from him or he walked away from them. You never see him chasing somebody down. Say, please, please, please follow me. And God's really convicted me about this for a while. You know, I've talked about this before. I don't like to walk away. And it's really hard for me to acknowledge that at times we have to step back. But I, I've learned this. If you walk away, I'm probably not going to chase you. I'm probably not going to contact you. I'm probably, in other words, I believe you've heard enough gospel here. If you want to go, you got to let people go. Can I get an amen? Some people want to walk away to see if you're going to chase them. Even I, I've learned to realize this. If you're connected with me in this house, God will put you in this house. Amen. If you're not connected with me in this house, then God bless you. Go find another house and somebody else to pester. Can I get an amen? Discernment. Everybody say discernment. So we're talking about discernment here, the act of perceiving the power to see what is not evident, reading character. When, if you're a, a, a business owner, if you're a leader in any kind of capacity, if, I mean, even as a parent, if, when kids get around your kids, you've got to be able to read character. You've got to be able to discern that. Discerning is a powerful thing to perceive. To see, it's not evident on the surface, so you've got to see it. So when I talk about uh, discernment for dummies, I'm talking about all of us learning how to perceive, how to grab hold of things. There is a difference between, and catch this, taxing and toxic people. When I talked about Judas, I was talking about a toxic person. When I talk about Peter, I'm talking about a taxing person. Taxing is simply difficult. They're just a little bit difficult. How many know at one time or another, we probably all were a little bit taxing? Amen. When I think about our property, David, I think about it's a little bit taxing to live on that property, that 110 acres. It's a great place to be, but you get water leaks, you get gas leaks, you get trees falling on buildings. You've got all kind of issues on 110 acres. Amen. So it's taxing. It's not toxic, but it is taxing. So I realize as I'm walking through life, there is a difference. When I talked to you about toxic people before, then you think that everybody's difficult is toxic. That's not true. Some folk are just taxing. They cost you. They wear you out. But they're worth loving. Can they get an amen? Amen. So in the past, I, I've tended to give so much time at, at times to people who do not want to change that I neglect people who do want to change. I still struggle with that. Uh, there are times a, a phone call will come into the office, and, and my son works the, the phones there, and he'll give me a note, and he'll look at me like, Dad, you're not returning that call. And I don't want to be mean, but you don't know how many times I've already returned this call, how many times I've dealt with this, amen, over and over and over again. After a while, folk got to grow. Mm, come on, give me an amen, please. Amen. So it's a difficult message to preach in our own church here today for a couple of reasons. One is the word toxic today is greatly overused. Man, have you noticed that? If I post something online and people say something negative in the comments about what I just posted, well, they're toxic. I can't tell you how many times I have commented on somebody's post and went back and deleted my comment because I thought to myself, they're going to think I'm being mean to them. When actually, I'm just trying to tell them the truth. 
Amen. When I, when I see people, well, I won't go there. Quit that. You need to be canceled. And that's what we do to people. We delete them. We, and even today, in the current atmosphere where everything seems radiating with tension, people are leaving churches over things they would never have before. We're raw. We're separated. We're vulnerable. And so it's very easy to conclude that, oh, you know, I just need to walk away. I need to get away. They're toxic. I need a different church. I need a different pastor. I need a different job. I need a different spouse. I need a different this. So also I've seen Christian leaders label everyone and anyone who questions their authority as, a, as toxic. Amen. If somebody says something against them, well, then evidently they're, they're toxic. I, I don't agree with that. Amen. Over 36 years of full-time ministry, uh, I've learned that, that there's several times that I've said to myself, hey, self, hey, self, if you find my body in a creek bed somewhere, knock on this person's door. Amen. Because I know they after me. I have felt that at times. There are people who, no matter how much you pour out to them, they will twist it and turn it back on you. No matter how much you love them, they will not interpret it as love. And it doesn't matter how sincere or how hard you try. Two weeks ago, we talked about Nehemiah. We brought him up in the message about toxicity. And Nehemiah's enemies, they attacked in three ways. First, they went to deceive him. Second, to divide. And third, to disqualify. Let me say it again. First, they went to deceive him. Second, they tried to divide him. Watch what toxic people do. And third, they disqualify. First, they deceived him. They invited him to the plain of Ono. Amen. Verses 2 and 4. This seems to be a reasonable request. The plain is equal distance between Samaria, which is where Sanballat lives, and Jerusalem, which is where Nehemiah was. He said, let's talk wall. Come on down and let's talk wall. Well, Nehemiah grabs his phone out. He looks at, you know what Nehemiah said? He said, I can't come down because I'm doing a great work. When I first read that, H, I thought to myself, he's on a ladder. They're down below. And they said, hey, come down and talk to us. Amen. But then I looked at it again and realized that if you Googled where Sand Ballad was and where, uh, he, uh, where Nehemiah was, it was 27 miles. 27 miles. For him to go on horseback and one day to go over to San Ballas place. And the Bible says they did it to deceive him. In other words, they were trying to take him out. They were looking for a way to pull him away from the great work so they could kill him. They could assassinate him, and that would shut down the work. Not only they did it once, they did it twice, three times, four times. They begged him, come on down. Nehemiah said, I, I can't come. I, I'm doing a great work. I cannot come down. Sometimes you got to say to yourself, you know what I'm doing? It's not worth your time or my time to go mess with you right now. I'm staying right here. Amen, because I know what you're out to do. Second, they wanted to divide. First, they sought to deceive him. Second, they set a trap, and they sought, thought to divide him. What do you mean by that, Pastor? The Bible says in verse 7, in the same way, San Ballad, for the fifth time, now we five times, sent his servant to me with an open letter in his hand. In it is written, it is reported among the nations, and Geshem also says it, that you and the Jews intend to rebel. That is why you are building the wall, and according to these reports, you wish to become their king. And you've also set up prophets to proclaim concerning you in their, in, in, uh, in, to be their king. And you have also set up prophets to proclaim concerning you in Jerusalem. There is a king in Judah. And now the king will hear these reports. Now, See, now he, he's talking about Artaxerxes. He's going to hear about it. The king of Persia will hear these reports. So now come and let us take counsel together. This is, this is absolutely division. He's trying to say to him, you know what you're doing, Nehemiah? You're setting yourself up. You're making yourself something. You're trying to usurp authority. You want to be the next king. You're getting everybody on your side. Amen. You, you, this is what I, I, I believe you're doing. Amen. These are your intentions. So here's an open letter boiling over with all these rumors, hoping to divide Nehemiah and the people. Amen. And the king who's supporting him to rebuild Jerusalem. So here, here it goes. They crafted it with an awareness of Jewish Masonic hopes. that this, They sound very realistic. If Artaxerxes hears about these rumors, let me tell you something. He's going to take you out, young man. What Sanballat is trying to do here is drive a wedge in that relationship by lying about Nehemiah's true intentions. And if he can do that, then Artaxerxes will turn on Nehemiah and shut the whole thing down. There are times you need to go to, the, to people and say, listen, I don't know what they said, but here's the truth. Amen. Somebody said this, but this here's what I'm telling you. Sometimes it could be to an employer. It could be your pastor. It could be to a spouse. But the truth needs to be out there. Can I get an amen? It's how toxic people work. They want to divide and conquer. I hope you're seeing this right now, what's going on with what we're seeing in, in Russia and Ukraine. Divide and conquer. 
Amen. In, in verse, verse 8, it says, no such thing. This is what Nehemiah said. No such thing as you say have been done. For you are inventing them out of your own mind, trying to intimidate us to make us afraid so we will give up. Then he says, God, strengthen my hand. Strengthen my hand. Amen. Nehemiah stayed focused on this thing. And then the third attack was the disqualifying. You, you have to look for this one just a little bit. Amen. So deceive him, divide, and then to disqualify. Nehemiah 6 verse 10 says, One day I went to the house of Shemaiah, son of Delilah and somebody else, who was shut in at his home. He was in quarantine. He said, Let us meet in the house of God inside the temple and let us close the temple doors because men are coming to kill you. They want to assassinate you. By night, they're coming to kill you. But I said, uh, hold on. Should I, should a man like me run away? Or should someone like me go into the temple to save his life? I will not go. I realized that God had not sent him. That's discernment. God didn't send him. But that he had prophesied against me because Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. Ah, you know you can pay for a prophecy. You can go to them palm readers. You can call 1-800-WHO-AM-I. And when they ask you who you are, you're supposed to say, well, you should know. Mm -hmm. I realize that God has not sent him, but that he had been prophesied against me because Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. He had been hired to intimidate me so that I would commit a sin by doing this, and when they would give me a bad name to discredit me. Destroy my reputation. So here's the thing. Many of us don't understand our walls, our walls. We have an enemy that's trying to deceive us, divide us, amen, discredit us and bring us down. And we have to protect our walls, amen, our, our life given inside of here. But here, Shemaiah apparently was a man that Nehemiah had trusted because he went to his home. He quickly realized he'd been hired. to. Uh, he discerned this, amen, to cause this to happen. So, here, Pastor, how would this cause Nehemiah to get discredited? First, I uh, sent a clear message, the work's in danger because Nehemiah's afraid and he's running from it. And let me just, I keep backing up on this thing here, but it, and I know there's so many different ways to look at this war that's going on, but this leader of Ukraine, dude, I don't know if you're picking up on this, but you got, you got an idiot over there in Russia with a suit on, amen, and, and a 16-foot table doing this broadcast. You got another guy walking out in the streets, amen, wearing army fatigues, saying, come on, amen, I ain't leaving. Uh, our president tried to get him to fly to America. He said, I I'm not leaving sin bullets. But come on, can I get an amen? I mean, you ain't seen the guts in this. I, I mean, I this is the first time I've seen a leader stand up for his country like that and say, hey, whether you like it or not or feel good about it, I'm not, that's not, I, I don't have an, uh, your opinion right now is not bothering me. I'm just telling you, this man right here, they're trying to assassinate him. They're trying to take him out because that whole country pivots on his, uh, uh, on his leadership. And right now, this wall depends on Nehemiah. So Nehemiah understands if I, if I go in there, people are going to think the wall. So secondly, it would disqualify me because of the fear, but out, not out of just fear, but out of ritual defilement. Remember, Nehemiah was a layman. He's a cupbearer. He's not a priest. He was most likely a eunuch. Remember, man, he worked for King Artaxerxes, and as that, he was not allowed to go into the holy place in the temple. So Shemaiah is trying to do get him disqualified by getting him to go in. Amen. He not, he's not even allowed to go into the temple. See, it's a different day there. So he can't, if I go in there as a eunuch, as a, as a cupbearer, they'll disqualify me. So I'm not going to do it. So he said, what, what man, verse 11, what man such as I could go into the temple and live? I ain't going in. And when he prays that, that brief prayer in verse 14, which also reveals the volume, don't miss the fact that there are a lot of visionary religious leaders in this day, as there are today, who are not tuned into the will or the work of God. Amen. They, they would run away. They, they would go hide. They'd do that. But he, he's going to stand there and fight. So listen to me. Some lessons we need to learn. First of all, toxic people can be superficially friendly. They're just superficial. i got to take these things out. Y'all can just look blurry for a few minutes. And I don't want to look at the clock, so I don't care. Amen. First of all, toxic people can be superficially friendly. They're just superficial. Notice Sam Ballard and his friends invited Nehemiah, come, let us meet together. They, they're toxic. Come, let us meet together. Secondly, they can be seemingly clairvoyant. 
When I say clairvoyant, I, it's if they can read your mind. Amen. You remember what they said? They, they said to him, I know why you're doing this. We, we, we pick up on what you do. You, you, you're doing this so you can become the king. They believe they know your real thoughts. So, you know, I know why, why you're here. They, they know your intentions better than you know your intentions. And they, their delusional aspect of their thoughts. This is why Nehemiah said in verse 8, you were inventing them out of your own mind. There are times you need to look at people and say, you're thinking wrong. Amen. You're messing this up. And, and again, you remember I told you a couple weeks ago, Jesus learned to talk to crazy. Sometimes you just got to tell crazy, you, you're crazy. Now, it doesn't mean that we ain't always a little crazy. We all got little issues there. But to stay that way, toxic people think things that don't mirror reality. This is just not reality. Their insecurities are like a giant magnet that pull together shards of truth and untruth into a distorted image of what is uh, their, their reality filter. It's warped. So messages that come into them get garbled. Now, hear me. We all got fiction factories. They're called your brain. It's a fiction factory. We all will dream something and think it's real. We, we'll, we'll think something and think it's real. You, you, we, we're ate up with conspiracies today. Amen. It's hard to discern what's truth and what's not. That's why you got to depend on this book. And everything you do got to filter through this book. Amen. People say, well, where is it? Is this war right now in this book? I don't know yet. I'll let you know later. Right now, I'm trying to get, make money for gas. Amen. So, so, so pay attention. But toxic people lack the humility to doubt their own thoughts. Uh, listen, all of us at times think crazy things. You know, you guys are looking at me like I'm alone in this. I'm not. I know you. You also think crazy stuff. I've seen you post it. Number three, relationally disrupted. Toxic people are relationally disrupted. Toxic people have an amazing ability to continue to pursue what they want, even if they don't get what they want, as long as you don't get what you want. That's heavy, isn't it? I'm going to say that again. Toxic people have an amazing ability to continue to pursue what they want, even if they don't get what they want, as long as you don't get what, they, what you want. They didn't want him to build that wall. Amen. They wanted to stop him. And we see this through this whole section of Nehemiah. The enemy will do anything they can do as long as they can keep Nehemiah from doing what God has called him to do. Often their minds and their lives are so chaotic, especially relationally. Amen. And the chaos is never their responsibility. They never own it. They never, it's always somebody else's. Amen. It's never their responsibility. Number four, subtly controlling because toxic people are intensely insecure, they seek to control other people. They feel more in control when other people are being controlled. <laughs> Judas tried to control the, the, the dialogue with Jesus when the woman let down her hair and, and broke the alabaster box. Toxic people. Sand ballot until by four or five times going after, amen. They refused to take a no for an answer. Five times, come let us meet together. Come let us meet together, amen. They were relentless. And that leads us to number five. They're creatively relentless. They don't pick up clues to back down. They don't pick up a clue to back down. I'm going to tell you something. It was God that allowed me to take my glasses off because I can't see any of your expressions. I feel free. I'm going to say it again. They, they, they don't pick up a clue to back down. So, so Gary Thomas, he wrote this. He said, here's how warped toxic opposition is. When a toxic person directs you and distracts you, they are seeking to become your God. We'll call it with a little G. Amen. Once again, it's about control. They want you to be directed and motivated by them. I will plead with your good nature. If that doesn't work, I'll threaten you. If that doesn't work, I will pretend I am your friend, and I'll try to trick you. I will enlist others, both civic and religious authorities, to back me up, but I am determined that you will eventually do what I want you to do. Whew, I knew this was going to get heavy this morning. That's why I'm glad there's certain folk ain't here. Pastor, what do we do? I'm going to say it like I told you two weeks ago. First, don't be toxic. 
Don't become, refuse to be distracted. When Nehemiah, amen, when I believe this is the big idea, the big picture, I'm doing a great work, I cannot come down, amen. Then he said, God, strengthen my hands. Keep that in mind. Communicate and help me keep doing what you've called me to do. This is the issue. I've got to pour my life into teachable people. I've got to find somebody who's teachable, and I've got to pour my life into them. I believe Nehemiah had those people around them. i tell you two people that were not, Sanballat and Tobiah, amen. He was not going to pour his life into them. So you've got to realign yourself with the redemptive purpose of God. God, what is it you called me to do? Help me to do that. Jesus stayed with it. I'm here to save sinners and to defeat the devil. He stayed with it. He did not get distracted. If I got to walk away from you, I will. Amen. If I got to let you walk away, I will. But I got to stay with the purpose of God in my life. That's what's important. That's why Jesus said in Mark chapter 1 verse 35, he rose early in the morning while it was still dark. He departed and went out to a desolate place and there he prayed. There are times you got to separate yourself and pray. Today as I leave to go to Colorado, I will be going by myself. I'm looking forward to the alone time. I'm looking for, and when I get there, believe me, I will not have any. My grandkids will suck every ounce of, of energy, emotion, and money from me. I'll come back almost depleted, but God will fill me. Can I get an amen? Amen. So I'm any, I believe many of us today, and particularly leaders, are discouraged at this time because we've allowed a lot of voices, amen, that are constantly flooding our minds. Business owners, the voices that are coming in, they flood our minds, our hearts with what is wrong. We have lost sight of who God is. We, we look at this Day, today with the, the pandemic and the, the gas prices and the foolishness in the White House. And, and let me just say this. You can't blame everything on Putin over there. Amen. We, 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 we voted this thing in. Well, I didn't. But we voted it in. 85 silent million people. I can't find one of them. Voted this thing in. And because of that, we've got ourselves in this situation. It's distracting. Amen. Believe, one, you know, one of the greatest, biggest culprits is the social media and the news media. I want to challenge you this week, you know, for you to take some time, just like Jesus did. Separate yourself. Get alone. Talk to him. Say, God, you know what? Help me be a kingdom person. Help me remind myself that there will be toxic people around me. But some folk are just taxing. And a lot of folk I've called toxic, they taxing. Amen. They're a little bit difficult, but they're worth loving. Can I get an Amen. Amen. So, Pastor, to help me understand here, I'm going to break it down for you. Hallelujah. First, to learn the difference, taxing, and I'm going to say the word difficult people, need help. We all need help at times. We all need a hand up. Not just a hand out, but a hand up. Amen. That, that's important. Toxic people make demands of you. They almost make you feel like you've got to do this. Now, you need to understand this because this is going to help you draw the line. Taxing difficult people can be hard to love, but they're worth loving. No one in here falls into that category, by the way. Nobody here falls into taxing difficult. If you don't think you fall into that category, then you probably are in that category. Again, toxic people are allergic to love. <sighs> you love them and love them and love them, and it doesn't seem to get through to them. Taxing difficult people expect you to be who God made you to be. They appreciate the fact that God's for you. Amen. Toxic people expect you to be who they expect you to be. They want to shape you in their image. Number four, difficult people will give you space. I call it emotional relational space. They're going to give you some space. Toxic people will not respect life space. So when you're praying, Pastor, can a toxic person change? Absolutely. Absolutely. The toxicity can be removed. The, I believe through the blood of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, amen, praying. But they've got to want to change. And they've got to see themselves in the mirror as somebody who's poisoning other people. And if you're taxing, you've got to say to yourself, okay, God, help me get into a place where I can reciprocate that which has been blessed into my life. Help me be that person that can pour back in. I was once down, but now I'm up. Help me to be merciful to others. Help me forgive others. Help me to pour back into them. So in summary, we're all called to love everyone. Care for the difficult. Invest in the teachable. Love everyone, even toxic. Amen. Love them. Love everyone, even the taxing. We give a lot of care and attention to the difficult and struggling, but we invest in the teachable. I found a proverb that bothers me, but I'm going to read it to you anyway. Whoever corrects 
a scoffer, toxic people, gets himself abused. And he who reproves a wicked man incurs injury. Do not reprove a scoffer. They'll hate you. What about somebody who's just taxing? Reprove a wise man. He'll love you. Give instruction to a wise man. He'll be still wiser. Teach a righteous man. He'll increase in learning. You can be righteous and taxing. You can be wise and taxing. Amen. And if you can love them, reprove them, you kind of show your stripes. Or so, one of the things I've learned to do over the last, and I do it very quickly, is learn to ask people to forgive me. When God puts his finger on it and says, you crossed the line. You said something hurtful. Amen. You shouldn't have done that. Hallelujah. I want to be a man with a little more discernment. Can I get an amen? Pray for discernment. Ask God to help you here. Mark Twain was kind of smart when he said, never argue with stupid people. They'll drag you down to their level, and then they'll beat you with experience. Amen. Hallelujah. Father, we cannot talk about toxic people without looking in the mirror and seeing where we would be without your grace. So we're not coming this morning. We're not sitting under your word dressed in self-righteous dress, trying to present a merit of our own. We preach, we sing, we praise. We pray in your name. You were labeled toxic. Jesus, you were labeled toxic by the religious of that day. They pushed you outside, but they didn't see really why you came. You sought out the teachable. You loved the taxing and the difficult. You never gave up on Peter. You didn't give up on James and John. You kept teaching them. God, as we in this house, we love you. But we're struggling with certain family members. We struggle with certain employees and employers. Give us discernment. Help us know how to reach, how to teach, how to love. And then to let certain people that need to walk away, walk away certain to stay away from. God, I love you. Thank you. Thank you for giving us your righteousness, for wrapping yourself around us. Thank you for straightening up our warped filters. Help us to see others differently. Give us wisdom from above as we live below. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, amen. Don't all shout me down at once, please. Hallelujah. Let, let me ask you a question. Does that help? Did that help you this morning? Hold on. Let me see if I, if, let me see your face. Did that help you this morning? It helped me. Amen. I knew it was a difficult thought. But I said, Lord, I taught on talks, but, but, but there are people that are just taxing. Amen. And at times I've been that way. I've been that way toward my wife and my children and vice versa. I've been, uh, you, you've been that way toward me and I toward you. I know that. Amen. I've been around other leaders. Some of them, they were so toxic, I won't even get around them anymore. I don't even respond to them. I, I don't even look at their stuff on social media. I see it as toxic. Amen. They're mean. And then I see some that just need help. I just want to help. Just want to be a help. In Jesus' name. Amen. As Pastor David comes, and as you reach for a, an offering, please be nice this morning. <laughs> Don't be mean to me now. Amen. If we're honoring God, this ain't about the preacher's preaching. If it was, I, I, I wouldn't even get a tip. But uh, this morning, honor God would you give in this morning. Amen. Those watching online, thank you for tuning in. Hallelujah. We're glad to have you doing that. David's going to mention several things, and uh, one of them, though, is we do have a conference coming up. In uh, next month with, with Pastor John Ramsey, I'm looking forward to having him with us. So make sure you, you make some time, particularly for that Sunday night, Sunday and Tuesday night, Wednesday night. Amen. We're going to have him here. And we start camp this week. Can you believe that? 
Amen. I think, what, how many have got 70? We got 100. So uh, things have changed as far as, uh, you know, dealing with, with camp. We, we got to know God give us wisdom as we move toward the, the summer with our prices and all that and help us to be able to bless kids with camp. Amen. When, when, when our, our cook, uh, Judy, told me, she said, Pastor, can't even find Kool-Aid. There's certain things we've always had, couldn't even find it. Amen. So it's trying to find the right things to service camp, be a blessing. If you want to come hang out, we'll be 9 o'clock on Thursday morning, uh, Friday morning. I'll be back. We're doing the ropes course. Come help out in the kitchen. Come hang out with us. We have a water leak for you to fix. Amen. Give it up for your pastor this morning.